Thank you very much for attending today. This is a uh, very special opportunity that you have, and I'm so happy that you're all here and you're taking advantage of this opportunity. Uh, we have Dr. David Sikora here to share his unique experience, uh, his experience and his family's experience. But before we get to Dr. Sikora, I want to thank um, Mrs. Curry's AP Studio Art and Block 2 Foundations in our classes. Mm -hmm. As you can see here, we have their artwork. So at the end of this uh, event in this program, please feel free to walk around and, and look at the artwork that has been done by Mrs. Curry's classes. They are amazing. We have a lot of talent here at Timberlane in so many different areas, whether it's music, theater, sports, art. So please take a moment at the end and look around and appreciate the wonderful pieces that these students have done. So. Born in Seattle, Washington, David Sakura is a third generation Japanese American, or a sensei. Since 1980, David has spoken widely to a variety of groups, including colleges, universities, and high school students, historical societies, and civic groups. His highly personal presentation describes the internment of Japanese Americans during World War II and his family's difficult experiences during that time period. David has been, invited, has been an invited speaker at the Wright Museum of World War II on three separate occasions up in Wolfboro, New Hampshire. If you haven't been to the Wright Museum in Wolfboro, New Hampshire and you're a World War II buff, I highly recommend going. It's an awesome museum. David holds a PhD in biochemistry, an MPH in public health, and retired in 2008 as an investment banker for an international Dutch bank. He currently sits on the board of the New Hampshire, Muse New Hampshire Music Festival and is a member of the investment committee of the Nisei Student Relocation Commemorative Fund. David lives in Thornton, New Hampshire, and his hobbies include building a Japanese-style garden and fly fishing. So, with that said, Dr. Sikor, thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Josh. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here again. This is one of my favorite schools to speak, speak at because of the warm welcome. Josh and Joanne and, and John, the principal, you've been very, very uh, welcoming. And I'm glad to be here for my second, third time? Third time. So, so I'd like to begin, first of all, by uh, recognizing that May, this month, we we celebrate uh, Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. Um, and I'm so happy that I'm here as part of that celebration here at Timberlane. I'd also like to remember Norm Manetta, who recently passed away. He was born in 1931, died in just recently. And Norm is a congressman from California for 20 years and was the driving force behind the passage of the Citizens Act of 1988, which contained an apology to the 80,000 Japanese American internees during World War II, including myself, the apology as well as a redress payment of some $20,000. So to begin with, my story begins with my grandfather, who was born in a small village on the west coast of Japan. Uh, in 1869. And this was at the time when Japan was just emerging from a feudal age and was beginning the May, its Meiji transformation, entering into the modern, modern world. As a young man, he converted to Christianity, and it was his dream to come to the United States to practice his newfound religion. Still, as a, as a teenager, he made his way to the port city of Yokohama, he walked the, all, the uh, entire length of 500 miles, and after a few years, he earned enough money for passage through the United States. He landed in Seattle in 1898, just before the turn of the century, at a time when there were only a few Japanese in the Pacific Northwest. By 1900, just two years later, my grandfather had earned enough money to send for a picture bride and to start a family in the States. With the help of a go-between, he narrowed down his search to two women, one a Christian woman, who unfortunately was not very attractive, and another woman, a stunning beauty from Akita Prefecture, 
a region in Japan that was noted for its beautiful women. What to do? Well, he solved his dilemma by choosing, of course, beauty over his religious beliefs. My grandmother arrived in 1900, and as the story goes, as she was disembarking from the ship, their eyes met and love blossomed. And in fact, love did blossom for less than 20 years. The Sakura family had grown to nine children, including four boys, thus assuring the Sakura name would survive for generations to come. But tragedy struck the family in 1919. My grandfather suffered a life-threatening injury, and he passed away, leaving my grandmother with nine children with no visible form of support. These were desperate times for the Sakura family. The two oldest boys, shown at the, at the top, barely out of their teen years, traveled around the country looking for work and would send money home to support the family. Their travels brought them as far south as Florida and as far north as the Yukon in Alaska. But before my grandfather passed away, he predicted that there would be a war between Japan and the United States, and that his sons should pledge their loyalty to the United States and fight on their behalf. Little did he know that his prediction would come true in less than 20 years. The fortunes of the family improved when, when my uncle, was recruited as a baseball player to join the Eatonville Lumber Company baseball team. And in return, the company, the lumber company, offered housing and employment at the mill. This is a view of the uh, lumber company uh, located in Eatonville, which is located south of Tacoma, Washington, in the shadow of Mount Rainier. So my dad and, my, and his brother began working at the mill and they quickly rose to a supervisory position, earning a, the living wage of $30 a month, a dollar a day. The mill company also provided housing for all the Japanese workers and their families. This little Japan town featured a Japanese-style bathhouse, community center, a company store stocked with all of our favorite Japanese groceries. In 1931, my parents were married, and the first member of our family was our pet dog, Puggy, who was a, a, uh, just a pup, a water spaniel, but he was a beloved member of our family. And I was born in 1936, and my mother and father felt relatively secure despite the deep depression that was sweeping across this country. Soon two more boys were added to the family, my brother Jerry in 1939 and my brother Chet Jr. in 1941. My parents were now living a comfortable life with many friends, both Japanese and Caucasian. My father had a thriving small business repairing radios. And I remember trips in our new car to vacation homes at the ocean, picking strawberries at a nearby farm, ski trips to Mount Rainier, and even a road trip to Portland, Oregon. Finally, during this pre-war time, the Sakura family had begun moving up the social economic ladder. Here's a clip from uh, some home movies showing what it was like living in Eatonville before the war. Our dog, Puggy, my dad's new car, and a tricycle that my dad built for us, for me. You notice that the housing wasn't great, but it was all we had, and our family was all together. The Sakura family all worked in the mill. We had wonderful celebrations, including the Harvest Moon picnic, and the more than 100 residents of the Japanese village turned out for the picnic, enjoyed games. What impressed me was the number of teenagers 
in the in the deli. The grocery store provided all the liquid refreshments for the young workers, and of course they could use the empty bottles for, for fun. Here's my mother on the right hand side. She was in a race to gather up the children and bring them home from school. This is a view of my my aunts and uncles, including Puggy. My brother Jerry was born in 1939. And my youngest brother, Chet Jr., born in 1941. My parents wanted, always wanted the girls, so they dressed him in a dress. <laughs> my aunt uh, Gracie, who lived in the village, val uh, graduated as valedictorian of the, uh, from the high school. Here's my class picture, and I'm sitting there on the right-hand side. And two weeks later, the Sakura family was sent to a detention camp in Puyallup, Washington. Shortly after the bombing of Pearl Harbor in December of 1941, war hysteria coupled with racial hatred towards the Japanese was rapidly spreading up and down the West Coast. Anticipating the arrival of, of this anti-Asian hostility, my father and a group of friends published a statement in the local newspaper declaring their loyalty to the United States and to its ideals. But of course, this pledge had no effect. The full force of this hostility had not reached our small community, and life continued as normal as possible. I found a Christmas card that was sent out in December of 1941. My father would come home every day from the mill for midday lunch. Here's a, again a class picture of, uh, of uh, a Christmas, uh, a class picture was taken while attending the elementary school. Although I was too young to under understand the full implications of this hostility, I sensed my parents were concerned about the precarious position and possible danger we were in. This photograph was taken just before the evacuation notice that came in May of 1942. We would have only two weeks to prepare for the evacuation and my parents stored some of their household items, including the brand new car, and had to give away most, including our dog, Puggy. And as I mentioned, this is the last photograph taken before we were sent to the detention camps. My brother Jerry, myself, and my best friend Tommy, and of course, Puggy, our dog. Years later, after the war, we learned that our faithful dog, for over 10 years, waited in the front yard of our friend's house for our return. But we never did return to Eatonville, and we were told that Puggy had died of a broken heart. Here's a clipping from the Eatonville Dispatch that had a small item on the front page of the May 6, 1942 edition. It described the departure of Eatonville's Japanese settlement. There was no description as to where our final destination would be. And years later, I was told by someone who witnessed the departure that he questioned the armed guard that was there guarding our small group. He was told in no uncertain terms that it was none of your business. There were no protests there, no tears shed, just a silent farewell to our home in the mountains. Prior to leaving Eatonville, the editor of the Eatonville Dispatch, Eugene Laren, who was a close friend of my father, asked him to act, to act as a correspondent and and to send reports back to the hometown newspaper. I believe Eugene Laren is an unsung hero of the internment story. He was brave enough to publish my father's letters in the face of a torrent of anti-Japanese sentiment. I recall the 45-minute bus ride from Eatonville past the Strawberry Farms to our new home called Camp Harmony located on the Washington State Fairgrounds. As we approached the fairgrounds, I recall the bus traveling down a long driveway lined with barbed wire fence as tall as the bus itself, 
I can still see the masses of people with Asian faces pressed up against the fence looking at the newcomers. I love this photograph because it confirms what I had in my memory, that the fence, the barbed wire fence that you can see in the background is almost as tall as the Greyhound bus. When we got off the bus, we were greeted by armed guards. And this was the first dispatch from Camp Harmony at the fairgrounds in Piala, written by my father and sent back to the Eatonville dispatch. After we were processed and fingerprinted by the FBI, we were given army, given army cots and mattress covers to be filled with straw. We were assigned a horse stall that housed our family of two adults and three children under the age of six. I have vivid memories of my mother crouched in the back of the horse stall trying to console her three-year-old son who was crying fitfully. For days, my, mother, my brother would not be consoled and would cry for what seemed like hours until he finally lost his voice and all that remained was a low, guttural, animal-like sound. During the summer of 1942, while we were still in the temporary detention camp, 10 permanent inter internment camps were being built in isolated parts of the country. I like to think about these locations as being America's Siberia. In September, we were taken by train to the Minidoka internment camp, located in the southern desert of Idaho. It's a 30-hour train trip, and it was made worse by the stifling conditions in the train cars. The guards required that the windows be shut and the shades drawn, and the heat in the cars were made even worse by the overflowing toilets. One evening, I can still remember opening the shades and peeking out the sweet smell of the cool evening air is still fresh in my memory. <clears throat> when we arrived at our destination, I remember, I remember getting off the train and an armed guard approached me and greeted me by my name. Hi David, he said. I was astonished. How did he know my name amongst all the 300 passengers on the train? As it turned out, since we were all required to wear government issued name tags with both our ID numbers, he simply read my tag with my name and my number, 17643C for child. We were totally unprepared for the chaotic scene that greeted us. What I saw was a dystopian city of endless rows of tar paper barracks that stretched into clouds of dust just hanging at the horizon. It seemed like we had been condemned to an Orwellian world because the U.S. government had found us guilty of some unspecified charge. Perhaps the only charge I was guilty of, of was being born Japanese American. This photo shows our room that was assigned to us. It was a large room in one of the barracks, and the barracks were arranged in 33 blocks, each housing over 250 people per block. Our room address was block 15, building 8, room E, and I was instructed never for, to forget 158E, for that was the only way I could find my way home. Our room was about the size of a standard room in an economy hotel, except it had no running water or toilet facilities. Besides the six, besides the six army cots and cotton mattresses, there were the only other piece of furniture in the room was a pot-bellied stove standing in the center of the, of the barracks. When we arrived, the sanitary conditions in the camp were primitive at best. 
For three months there was no hot water or toilet facilities, only outhouses. By Thanksgiving the communal toilets and showers were finally installed and located in a central building in each block. You see the barracks on the right and the central buildings, which included the mess hall and the shower facilities on the left. There was no privacy for both men and women in the toilet and shower facilities. My mother, who was afraid of leaving me alone in the men's shower room, would often take me to take, a, take me and have a shower with her. I was so humiliated and embarrassed standing there amongst a group of naked women of all shapes and ages. You guys in the audience, can you imagine doing the same with your mother? I, I can guarantee you none of you would take a shower for years under those circumstances. There was a widespread use of cesspools under many of the individual units. They provided the primitive means of disposing wastewater from our barracks room. However, they posed a serious public health problem. I recall my brother coming home one day after he had fallen into a neighbor's cesspool. The sight of him and especially his smell was unforgettable. Early in 1943, the Army announced that volunteers would be accepted from the internment camps. My father and his three brothers responded enthusiastically, remembering their father's admonition that when war comes, the boys should fight for America. However, my mother was adamantly opposed to the idea, and she begged my father not to go and leave her as a single parent to struggle with the three young children. This is a photograph taken by a government photographer, and I view this photograph as a propaganda photo showing how happy we were in the camps, how loyal we were to the, uh, to the United States, how the four brothers are an example of loyalty by enlisting in the U.S. Army. But what is really unsaid is the, the trauma, the, the, the pain and suffering that our family endured. My aunt Alice on the far left gave birth the moment she arrived in camp. There were no medical facilities and the, and the delivery was very, very difficult. I don't think she ever recovered from the trauma of giving birth to my cousin Freddie. Nevertheless, my father left in the summer of 1943 and we would only see him sporadically until the end of the war. As my father was leaving for basic training, I recall him telling me that I was now the man of the house and that I was to take care of my brother and two boys. I took his advice seriously, but in retrospect, I see how this was an impossible task for a seven-year-old. Years later, my father wrote, the intervening years after leaving for service until the end of the war was a struggle for my mom. I remember my mother trying to maintain a sense of normalcy under almost impossible circumstances. At least on one occasion, she would succumb to the stress and anxiety that was endemic to life in the camp. She would spend at least one week in the camp hospital due to a case of exhaustion. I love this photograph of our family. My mother tried to dress us in identical clothes. My brother and I, looks, it looks like my brother and I have hand-me-downs from the Salvation Army. Our shoes are covered with dust. We are sitting on a pile of rocks, for there was no other place to take a family photograph. Life in the camps, unlike shown in the previous slide taken by a government, government photographer, life was brutal, it was cruel, and it was really difficult. And my mother, I don't think, ever recovered from, from that experience. 
And years later, my father even admitted that the intervening years after leaving for service was a struggle for my mom. On a more happier note, for a change of pace from the monotony of camp, she would take us on picnics. After packing a lunch, she would take us through the rattlesnake-infested sagebrush to the barbed wire perimeter, and there we would have a picnic in the shadow of the watchtower. Those watchtowers were, armed, were manned by armed guards, and they, we were told that the guns that were pointed were pointed outward to protect us. But in fact, those guns were pointed inward to guard us. On another occasion, we went as a family on a vacation to a Bible camp in Sun Valley. The trip was led by Reverend Andrews, who was the pastor of my grandfather's Japanese Baptist church. It was there that I learned to swim, and I wrote a letter to my father, who was in training with the 442nd uh, Regimental Combat Team in Mississippi, where I excitedly told him of my great swimming achievement. In this photograph, you can see that my father had sent t-shirts from Camp Shelby, where he was in training. But my fondest memory of camp was that early spring day in 1944, when I was invited to a play date with a classmate by the name of Betsy Davidson. She wasn't Japanese, she was Caucasian, with blonde, curly hair, blue eyes, and she was the daughter of the associate director of the camp. Betsy and I played together all afternoon in the front yard of her house, located in the administrative section of the camp. It was a memorable experience for me, an experience of pure pleasure that I sometimes think about, Betsy, nearly 80 years later. I wonder if she would even remember having a play date with an awkward, nearsighted Japanese-American boy from Eatonville, Washington. In 1944, after being interned in Minidoka for nearly two years, we were given an indefinite leave to travel to the Midwest under the sponsorship of the American Baptist Home Mission Society. We were given a one-way ticket to Wisconsin and along with $25 cash, to cover our expenses. Late in the evening on that first day while traveling on a crowded troop train, my mother got off, the, got off at the Cheyenne, Wyoming station to buy sandwiches for the boys. As she was making her purchases, she saw to her horror that the train was leaving the station with the three boys on board. She ran desperately down the platform, climbed safely aboard the car, but I still think about what could have happened if she had not gotten back on the train? What would have happened to us, the three boys traveling eastbound alone into the night? After several false starts, our family was admitted into public housing in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. The rent was a princely sum of $20 per month, and soon thereafter, at the end of the war, my father came home, and shortly thereafter, my third brother joined the family. We were all together now, and I was no longer the head of the family, and now for the second time, our family was beginning to climb up the social economic ladder. So let me conclude by what are some of the lessons that we can learn from the internment story, the internment of Japanese, over 100,000 Japanese Americans during World War II. The internment story sheds a light on a dark chapter in American history. It il illustrates how democracy, the concept of democ democracy, is still an experiment and how fragile the fabric of democracy can be. But it, this story, in my being here, gives us a, a chance to come together and discuss how this fabric, this fragile fabric of democracy, can be strengthened in the future. 
And more specifically, my internment story, the internment story, tells of the potential violation of our individual constitutional rights during times of crisis. Do you think it's, it can happen again? Do you watch the news and see that we're in times of crisis? But it's also important to remember that the wrongs of the past, that the internment of U.S. citizens, this wrong can be acknowledged and corrected. And finally, this internment story, our internment story, is a story of personal triumph over adversity. I hope that this story will encourage others, all of us here, to show empathy to those refugees, even today, who are struggling with their displacement. Thank you very much. So we'll open it up for a little uh, Q&A. So if you feel that you have something to say or if you have a question about Dr. Sikora's story, feel free to uh, raise your hand and ask your question. So. Um, was there schooling at these internment camps? Yes, uh, there, was, there was, of course, high school, uh, a high school. But there are two elementary schools because in the uh, camp, uh, camp that I was in, in Minidoka, there were over 6,000 children. And so there were two elementary schools. Uh, one I, I attended for first grade. And in the second year, I in, uh, attended the Stafford Elementary School for second grade. But I do recall every day we would gather as a school and we would pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. Despite the fact that we were behind barbed wire guarded by the U.S. Army soldiers. Speaking of uh, the, uh, going to school, there were no buses, so I, I would have to walk to school. And I was told never to get, forget my address, Block 15, Barricade, Room E, because that was the only way I could find my way home from school. And heaven help me if I ever got lost. Even now, I, I have these reoccurring nightmares that I'm in some strange city that, all, that looks all alike, and that I can't find my way home. So I think the idea of memorizing 15 AE stuck with me, even though that happened over 80 years ago. Yeah. I was curious if your, if your siblings, um, you can ended up in New Hampshire, did they stay kind of closer to you all spread far and wide? Or? Well, I, I think it's amazing that I would end up here in Plasto in, at Timber Lane in New Hampshire. When I was born in Seattle, I can't get any further away from my birth, my birthplace. But we uh, uh, lived in public housing until the early 1950s. And it was then my father finally was able to buy his first home in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. We all went to public school in Milwaukee, and, and I, I'm, I'm so happy to be here and to learn of your music program, your drama program here at, at Timberlane. And when I first arrived at the public housing, I enrolled in the fourth grade at Pleasant View Elementary School. And I distinctly remember my music teacher, Miss Kepke, who for our music part of the curriculum, we li listened to the entire Wagner Ring series in German. <laughs> it was an excruciating experience, but it was there that I learned to love music. And in fact, Milwaukee, which was 
a socialist city with a socialist mayor had an extensive music program. And there it was there that I took music lessons and really began my love of music in Milwaukee. But getting back to your, your question, uh, my brothers and I went to public high school in Milwaukee. We all went off to college. Uh, my two brothers uh, both became doctors and are now retired but living in, on the West Coast. And I went on and got, as, as uh, Josh indicated, I, I have my doctor and a master's degree and finally ended up working overseas for an investment bank. So it's a story of difficulty and trial, but I think it's an immigrant story of perseverance and opportunity that we all have in this country. So I can't see anybody back there, but I bet you there's a, one more question back there. Um, is there anybody you met that, um, like after you guys were released, that you like stayed in communication with for a while? Um, I think that's one of the sad parts of this story, is that in my first four years of elementary school and kindergarten. I was in, I, I never stayed in the same school, so I have no recall of any friends that I made during, during those four or five formative years. But since that time, I, I have many friends, so all's well that ends well. Okay. Um, during your time at the camp, did anybody try to, including yourself, try to make art or music? Well, that's a that's a great story, a wonderful story, because uh, I forgot to bring one example of the craft arts and crafts that were made in the camps. I'm told that people would take. Uh, basically scraps of wood or pieces of a sagebrush and make little birds out of it. And I, I have at home a copy of a hand-carved bird that was made in Minidoka. So arts and music was, was a really important part. One, one way of passing away the time, but also there was a, I think there's a creativity that, that you see amongst some of the posters here, to create beauty out of, out of scrap material. And uh, I think one of the unsung stories of the internment is the artwork and the poetry that was created while behind barbed wire. And I'm so happy to see your, your art display uh, I, th I think it's, it's wonderful to think about a small incident that happened over 80 years ago and that you have the opportunity to learn more about it. David, um, since uh, everybody in this space here has just passed through uh, a couple of difficult years of, of COVID uh, and that created isolation, not attending school. I wonder if you could speak to what happened to you in, in the late 40s, early 50s in Milwaukee. In Milwaukee. <clears throat> well, we, uh, we were settled by the, uh, the uh, War Relocation Authority in a studio apartment in downtown Milwaukee after arriving from Minidoka. And it was a upgrade from our barracks room because it had running water and a toilet. But unfortunately, when we were assigned that studio apartment, 
there was a polio epidemic that was raging throughout the country, including Milwaukee. And as a result, we were quarantined for the summer in a one-room studio in a, recon in a converted office building. And we couldn't leave our, st our building. So we spent the entire summer with my mother working, the children sequestered in a one-room studio for the summertime. And I remember playing on top of the office building amongst the uh, broken bottles that had been thrown out from the transient hotel next door. So when I think about the COVID uh, pan uh, epidemic, pandemic, and I think about being cloistered or quarantined, we had no television, we had no laptops, we had no iPhones. All we had was the opportunity to look out the window and listen to the radio. So my, my feeling about this pandemic and being quarantined, you guys don't know how good you had it being quarantined as we are have been during the COVID crisis. It, it was so bad living in that studio apartment. My grandmother was given the task of taking care of the three boys. And we were so uh, confined and tempers got so hot that my grandmother finally gave up and left in a fit of anger and went back to live with her other daughter and not with our family. So we were left alone, the three of us, eight hours, 10 hours at a time, alone, quarantined in a one-room studio in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I should also add, no air conditioning. That was even worse. Uh, seeing current political events happening in other parts of the world um, and similar events happening, how does your experience make you feel about world news? Well, I, I think if you think about the refugees, the, the almost four million refugees from Ukraine moving to Poland, some of these refugees that moved on to Canada, uh, I think it's one. I think it's one thing to watch it on TV, but I think my story, this story of internment, is that all the refugees all around the world suffer great trauma. And I hope that we can understand or even feel some of the trauma that these refugees are going through, and especially the children. The children are, are quiet, they're, they're frightened, and I think it's important that we understand the impact, the long-term impact of what it's like being a refugee. And that's my message. I was six years old at the time, but even now, after 80, over 80 years, I have difficulty thinking about some of the memories of that traumatic time. I have one more question. Oh, we have one more. Um, you know, I, I really couldn't even begin to articulate what happened until I was in my 40s, maybe even a bit my 50s. And um, my, my father, my mother never talked about it. It was only after uh, about the experience because it was so traumatic. And it was only after I found my father's letters that were published in the Eatonville Dispatch that I was able to begin to understand some of his feelings about the internment. But it took me until I was in midlife to even face the issue of being interned because somewhere, somehow I felt that 
it was so embarrassing that it was as if we had done something wrong. But I finally realized that it wasn't our fault. We weren't guilty. It was the government that put us in those camps. So even, even now, one way that I feel this sense of healing is by talking about it and talking to you about it and to tell you some of the personal feelings that I felt while in the internment camp. So part of the healing is to be able to, thanks to Josh, talk about our story during the internment in World War II. So thank you very much for that question. Thank you for sharing your story with us. Um, every time I hear you speak, it's just, I'm so moved and so honored that you are sharing your story and you're helping us, but you're helping yourself as well. And we're so honored that you came to Timberlane and mm -hmm. told your personal story. So thank you very much, Dr. Spohr. Mm -hmm.